Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, good afternoon to those of you joining, joining us from China. Uh, welcome to the third installment of our uh, CBBC webinar week. Uh, uh, we're holding webinars all this week on the subjects of uh, doing business in China for SMEs. Uh, my name is Mark Headley from the China Britain Business Council. Um, and the subject of today's webinars is that of avoiding common scams when doing business in China. On Monday, we, um, we had a webinar all about working with partners in China. Yesterday, the subject was selling online in China. And all of those uh, subject areas do require working closely with Chinese partners. So I'm sure that um, the subject of how to avoid scams is, is very relevant to those, uh, to those things as well. Just a brief background on uh, the China Britain Business Council before I hand, hand across to our, our speaker, Helen Ju. Um, we are the main organization in the UK for helping UK companies to do business in China. We've been established since 1954, so next year is our 60th anniversary. Um, we're there to provide advice, support, and networking for companies of all sizes and from all sectors when doing business in China. Um, we're also a membership organization, so it's possible to join the China Britain Business Council. And I would certainly recommend any of you, any of you that are seriously thinking about doing business in China that you consider uh, joining our network. Uh, we have a network of, of 23 officers across China and the UK, including 13 officers uh, right across China, including our most recent offices opened up in Changsha and Xi'an. Um, we also merged together with the British Chambers of Commerce in Beijing, and we hold, hold lots of events and networking activities both in China and here in the UK. Uh, finally, we're also UKTI's strategic partner uh, and carry out business-to-business um, -business research and partner identification services for companies uh, looking to do business. Uh, in China. Um, you can find a lot more information about us on our website and also via our Twitter feed which you see at the bottom of the page there. So this week, um, very much following up on the, uh, the Prime Minister's visit to China last week, um, we've sort of put together a, a series of uh, resources uh, for SMEs looking to do business in China. So if you, if you visit our website, we have a special page set up there. Uh, that's at www.cbbc.org slash SME to China. And on there, you'll, you'll find a variety of resources, including uh, a CBBC guide to doing e-commerce in China. Um, there's a, a report that's been written together with Royal Mail on the subject of targeting the Chinese consumer. You'll also find on, find on there hundreds of uh, live business opportunities. Uh, practical fact sheets for SMEs, and also a number of case studies uh, from other businesses that have uh, been successful uh, entering the China market. In terms of the webinar week, um, as I mentioned, we've already had sessions on finding an agent or distributor in China. Uh, yesterday we talked about selling online, and today the subject is avoiding common scams when doing business in China. Um, tomorrow we have a session on uh, marketing your products in China, uh, which, I'm, which I'm sure will be very interesting. And then on Friday we also have um, a session on applying for CCC uh, certification, which will be particularly relevant for any electronics or um, companies uh, looking to sell uh, equipment and machinery into, into the China market. Uh, a big thanks to the EU SME Centre for helping us put this series of webinars together. Um, a brief background on the EU SME Centre. This is a project funded by the European Union. Um, it exists to help European SMEs to export to China and to establish, develop and maintain commercial activities in the Chinese market. Um, it's a free, confidential um, source of information and advice, providing practical support services. Um, and in terms of um, the EU SME's resources in Beijing, there are a number of um, sector experts on different areas of doing business in China. Um, they're available for one-to-one -one consultations. They have a knowledge center there. And if you visit the EU, EU SME website, there's lots of webinars 
on there, lots of free reports and information and advice uh, for SMEs uh, looking to enter the China market. And again, uh, EU SME Centre also has uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube present. So lots of resources there and I urge you to, uh, to visit those, those platforms to take a look at the, the resources available. Um, so I will uh, shortly hand across to um, Helen Jew from the EU SME Centre. Uh, just a brief background to, to Helen. Um, she's a senior legal consultant in the EU SME Centre. Uh, she's worked for a, a lawyer for many years in China, specialising in the area of foreign direct investment, uh, general corporate and commercial laws, taxation law, etc. Um, she's worked with many uh, European uh, companies from, from different European countries over the years, advising on uh, proposed transaction models, compliance, uh, regulations in, in China, and providing legal expertise and opinion. Um, she works very closely with a, with a team of, of um, legal experts at the EU SME Centre, um, and I'm sure that uh, any of you that have specific questions or advice, uh, that team will be more than happy to follow up with you. Okay, so with no more further ado, I will um, hand across to uh, Helen to get started uh, with her presentation. Um, there, you will see a, uh, a panel. Um, each of you will see a panel. That, uh, you can ask questions through the course of the, of the presentation, and there will be some time for Q&A um, at the end. So um, please feel free to, to uh, send any questions through to us, and I'm sure Helen will be more than happy to, uh, to answer those questions. So, uh, I'll, okay. Yep. Hello. Go ahead, Helen. Okay. Uh, thank you for a kind introduction, Mark. Hello, everyone. This is Helen from US Me Center. Now, let's come to today's topic avoiding common scams when doing business in China. China is a big market. Um, to do business in China, foreign companies, including U.S. means, need to know more about their partners in China. Same as in any other country in the world, there are both honest and dishonest businessmen in China. Today, our topic is about scams, and I will show you some real scams U.S. means encountered. But don't be discouraged from doing business in China by such introduction. And allow me to say that most Chinese business, businessmen are honest and willing to de develop sustainable business relationship with foreign partners. Part of our work here in the center, including today's webinar, is to help U.S. means to identify those dishonest potential partners and to choose to do business with those honest. Next, please. My presentation today on scams will take about 45 minutes, and it is divided into three parts. In the first part, I will introduce some most common scams. In the second part, I will, I'd like to share with you some experience from the center on what USMCEs can do to identify the risks at the early stage. We also call it preventive measures. In the last part, I will talk about what is suggested for an USME if it suffers from loss due to a scam. Next slide, please. Before I go into details, I'd like to learn um, how many of you have encountered a scam when doing business in China. Okay, Helen, so we have launched uh, a poll there. So if you could just click on whichever uh, poll answer is correct for you. I'm, uh, I'll hand back over to Mark. Okay, so I will continue. So, so we're just running okay. a poll, Helen. So just before you continue, I think we'll just wait to see what the, uh, what the answer to the poll, poll are. So this is, as question is whether or not people have been scammed previously in China. So uh, the options are no, I've never been scammed. Yes, and I succeeded to, to cover my loss, uh, and yes, and I incurred a loss. So we're just waiting for the, uh, for the answers to come through. Um, we know here at, here at CBBC 
every day we hear about uh, lots of companies that are um, concerned about scams. They may have been approached by Chinese companies that they um, unsolicited inquiries, may, maybe orders for, for, for large volume of products. And um, often there are questions about whether or not the company is legitimate. Um, so we're just waiting for the poll results. Um, it, so it's come through, so that there's 88% are saying no, we've never been scammed in China. Um, so that means that 12% have been scammed, um, and about half of those were able to uh, su uh, succeeded in covering their loss, and half of them uh, did incur a loss. So glad to hear that the majority of you haven't been scammed, but obviously um, maybe that's because you're new to China, uh, looking at doing business in China for the first time. So. Uh, with that, I'll hand back to you, Helen. Yeah, uh, thank you for your sharing, and uh, I hope today's webinar will help you to uh, your help your future business in China. Okay, let's continue. Uh, slide uh, eleven. Based on the inquiries about scams the center received, we list some scam common scams here. It is not exhaustive, but these scams are typical and most commonly seen in practice. Next slide, please. Usually in business activities, individuals contact you in the name of a Chinese company. Hello, Mark. Next slide, please. Okay, Helen, we're on problematic partners. Okay. Okay, thank you. We list on our slide four kinds of problematic partners which you SMEs may counter. First one is fake companies. The company does not really exist. The individual contacting USMEs just fabricated the name of a company. This can be identified very easily if you take the preventive measures we recommended today. Checking with the online database of relevant registration authority, we also call it online AIC check, and verification of business license can help you avoid scams very easily. I will talk in detail about this in the second part. The second problematic partners is uh, imposters. The company whose name is used does exist, but the individuals contacting SMEs are not who they claim they are. They cannot represent the company. Such risks can, or may also be identified if preventive measures are taken carefully. The third kind of problematic partners are paper tigers. Companies do not exist do exist from legal perspective. Individuals do operate the company. But the company was set up as a vehicle to cheat and does not possess real assets. We can introduce one type of paper tiger here. In China, set up a domestic company comparing with set up a foreign invested enterprise is much easier. It happens that some individuals use others' ID card to set up a real company and use it to cheat. After one or several scams succeeds, they just close this company. Even though SMEs, they can find the investor recorded on the files of their AISC authority, it's not possible to get their loss compensated. Both scrutinizing paperwork documents and visiting operation premises are needed in order to identify this kind of problematic partner. The fourth kind of partner with problem is companies using loopholes in regulations or contract. The company exists and operates normally, but it takes advantage of the provisions in the contract and or applicable laws to cheat. Our suggestion is if the applicable law is Chinese law, please consult with Chinese lawyers before you sign a contract with a Chinese partner. Okay, next slide please. Based on the classification above, I will introduce some real scams USMEs encountered. In this slide, 
we list two cases. Both were that U.S. needs bought products from China. They made advance payment as required, and then the Chinese partner just disappeared. No one took the phone calls. No one responded to the emails. U.S. needs turned to us for help, sent us all the documents for review. In the first case, all documents are in English alone, even the name of the Chinese partner. Eventually, we find this seal, the rectangular one. The top of this company on the contract is, as you can see, it's illegible. Just like every individual with Chinese nationality has, a, has his official Chinese name, every country registered in China shall also have an official Chinese name. Without knowing its registered Chinese name, we cannot pinpoint which specific Chinese partner this is. So, in the second case, the Chinese partner has a Chinese name. It seems it's registered in Shenyang. It's a city in Longing province in northeast China. But when they checked with the online database of the competent registration authority in Shenyang, we cannot find any information on this company. In fact, it does not exist. The Chinese partner just fabricated this Chinese company's name and use it to cheat. Uh, we, have, we have a report named Knowing Our Partners in China. Both of these, these two cases is about, uh, about sourcing from China. It's out of the service remit of the center. But if these US and have, they contacted us and read our report before they made payment, this would not happen. If they, if they can provide a duplicate business license to us, we can even make a check for them with the online business, uh, with the online database of the AIC authority to see if this Chinese company exists or not. Next slide, please. The scams by the second type of problematic partners list here also they are due. Um, the first one, the first one is um, a scanned copy of a duplicate business license of a Chinese company with Chinese name and other registered information on this business license. Uh, we checked. We do the ASC online AS check and find out that this company exists. But when we review the scan duplicate business license, we received find that this is not most updated one. This business license was issued in 2000, and the USME received it from the Chinese partner in August 2012 then there should be at least two annual inspection seals on this business license, but there is none. We will talk about how we identify this, help the SME to identify the risk. The second case on the slide is that the duplicate business license is OK. It's the updated one. And this company is registered in Dalian. The people contacting the USME is not the legal representative. So we suggested the USME to ask for power of attorney. And under power of attorney, there is a seal of this chip we put here on this slide. And then we checked with the competent public security bureau in Dalian and find out that the official company stop used in Dalian, it's not like this. We also succeeded in identifying the risk for the USME. Both the USME, they contacted us before they make payment. So lucky for them, our work helped them to identify these dishonest partners. Next slide, please. We list two kinds of scams here. 
the forms of the third kind of scam can be like this. First, a potential Chinese partner may sign a contract with an USME, buying large quantity of products at a very good price, and then ask the SME to send people to China to attend some ceremony and ask the people to buy some expensive gifts for them. All they claim the contract needs to be notarized, and they ask the SME to share part of the notarization fee. Or they claim the certain products to be imported to China need to be registered here in China, and which will cost a certain amount of money, and they ask the SME to pay for such registration. The Chinese partner can even issue invoice to the SME with breakdown. In our daily work, all these forms of scams mentioned were ever encountered by the USME. That's true. But in China, under normal circumstances, notarization of a contract is not mandatory, except for real property transfer contracts involving foreign elements, or donation contracts involving real properties. For contracts which are not mandatorily required to be notarized, the parties to the contract may agree to how its contract, their contracts notarized or not. But kindly note that notarization of a contract cannot guarantee the validity of a contract. If there is contrary evidence which can reverse the notarization, or there are inherent flaws in the contract which make the contract invalid, the notarization cannot play the function it meets. In addition, if a party to a contract is a foreign enterprise, notarization of the contract in China requires the foreign enterprise to provide many documents, such as a certificate of incorporation, which shall be notarized by the local notary in the country it is registered, and legalized by the Chinese embassy or consulate there. Therefore, you can see it is costly to have a contract notarized here. So most cases, Chinese partner use uh, notarization as an uh, excuse, asking for payment. Be careful; it may there may be problem. As for registration, invoice from the Chinese partner does not prove anything. Ask the Chinese partner to provide legal basis for such registration requirement, please. And we should see. Uh, also, such inquiries. Someone representing a Hong Kong company contacted U.S. company claiming they were based in Shenzhen. Please note that Hong Kong is a separate jurisdiction from mainland China. A qualified Hong Kong service provider may enjoy some preferential treatment based on the arrangement between mainland China and Hong Kong. Other than that, a Hong Kong company is treated as a foreign company. It cannot operate in mainland China like a local company registered here. OK, next slide, please. Sometimes partners really exist and operate normally, but still prudence needs to be given when it comes to conclusion of the contract. An USME once signed a contract with a Chinese company to buy oil and made a once payment as agreed. When goods arrived, it is water. But in the contract, it is provided that the inspection report on the quality of the goods made by the third-party inspection institution is final and binding. However, the third-party inspection institution is provided in fact to be engaged by the seller, which is the Chinese partner. So in this case, the Chinese partner used a loophole in the contract to take advantage of the USME. The second scam example in, on this slide is two companies established long-term business relationship. An USME received an email from the working email address of the staff of a Chinese company saying this, there is something wrong with his email box and uh, notified the USME to send email to another email address. 
later on this new email address from this email address an instruction for payment is given. After payment, the USME did not receive any goods. When they contacted the Chinese company, they got the response. This company did not give any payment instruction, nor received any payment. There are several possibilities. The company did this and denied it. All the Chinese staff did this, and the company didn't know or someone else access the staff's email address illegally and both the company and the staff were not aware of it. Next slide please. The second part of this webinar is what preventive measures in US and you can use to prevent it from being cheated. Doing business in China you may encounter different types of business partners. The scams we introduce today mainly involve trade of goods, but in fact, importers of goods is just one kind of business partners you may encounter. There are many other kinds of business partners, such as joint venture partners, service providers, etc. The preventive measures we share here also apply to other kinds of Chinese company partners. Next slide, please. Ask the potential Chinese partners to provide documents. Scrutinize these documents to learn their legal status and financial conditions. The most important one document among all these listed here is business license. We will talk about this in detail later. Also, please ask, you can ask for the scan copy of the ID card of the legal representative of the company. If the people who contact you is not the legal representative of this company, ask for a power of attorney duly authorizing this person to act on behalf of the company. This power of attorney shall be sealed with the official company store stamp and review the company stamp. We will talk about the company stamp later too. And there are, may also be some other documents that depends on specific business activities involved. If it involves real estate transfer, definitely you need to ask for the land use rights certificate and the real property ownership certificate. If your business with the Chinese partner involves IPR, intellectual property right, you may need to review their IPR ownership certificate. All these documents are issued by various authorities in China. And uh, one common point is they are all in Chinese because Chinese is the official language here. Next slide, please. As for review and verify the business license. Business license is the basic doc document evidencing the identity of a company registered in China. In China, there is an authority called Administration for Industry and Commerce, abbreviated as AIC. Its headquarter is called State Administration for Industry and, Co and Commerce, ICIC. This authority have local branches in each province and city in China. This authority is responsible for establishment registration and alteration registration of all companies under its jurisdiction and it issues business license to companies. The safest way is to visit the potential partner's premises to see the original. But in practice, the situation may not be so ideal. Usually partners agree to send a scanned copy of the duplicate business license. 
this is how it looks like. The format of this document may be slightly different, but contents are same. It shall be sealed with the relevant AFC stamp. As you see on the bottom left right corner. And it this document usually include basically twelve items. Next slide please. We did an English translation of the contents for you to learn its contents. Due to time constraint, I will comp explain four items among them. Name, legal representative, business scope, and annual inspection. About name, in China, as I said, Chinese is the, official, the only official language. As mentioned previously, that like any individual with Chinese nationality have a, shall have a Chinese name. Every company registered in mainland China shall have an official com Chinese uh, company name. If your potential Chinese partner does not provide its duplicate business license, uh, not even tell you its Chinese name, Believe me, it's highly likely that there's something wrong with it. As for legal representative, in China, every company should have a legal representative. It should be an individual. It can be the general manager, the chairman of the board of directors, or the executive director if there isn't a board of directors in the company. The legal representative is the one whose official action represents the company. If anyone wants, if anyone else wants to represent the company, he or she needs to be duly authorized by the company. A properly drafted power of attorney, which shall be sealed with the official company stamp, can serve the function. The third item: business license. Different from situation in many foreign countries, even different from Hong Kong. In mainland China, what business activities the companies love to engage in depends on its business scope indicated on their business license. If its business scope shows that it can only provide consulting services, then it cannot engage in trading, not to mention manufacturing activities. Sometimes you SMEs ask us, how can I know my potential partner is the manufacturer of the goods I ordered? My suggestion is see it, uh, to review its business license, business scope first. As for any inspection, this is a very important item in the business license. In China, the enterprise shall be subject to annual inspection as of the next year after it goes through the Establishment registration. The annual inspection shall be conducted between the period from March 1st to June 30th of every year. If a company fails to conduct annual inspection in this period, the comp competent ASC authority will specify a time limit for it. If it fails to do so in the specified time limit, the ASC will make public, public announcement. If it still fails to conduct an inspection within 60 days after publication of the announcement, its business license will be revoked. That's a very serious problem. Many business cannot proceed without the business license. Without it, a company may have difficulty in purchasing and selling. Since it cannot make payment to a seller outside China, and it cannot purchase invoice from tax authorities, not even, not to mention issue tax invoice. Okay, next slide, please. So, if a business license was issued in November 2011, in July 2012, normally there should be an inspection stamp for the year 2011, or marked with Chinese character, it has passed the annual inspection for the year 2011. 
So now you know what's wrong with this business license. It is possible that someone else access the company's business license and keep a copy of it. Use it claiming he is presenting the company. So ask and review the business license carefully. Okay, there is another way to verify There's another way to verify the business license. To check with the online database of the competent ASC authority, we call it online ASC check. It's a free of charge service available for public by the ASC authorities. Each ASC authority has its website. If a company is registered with ICIC, you can use the company name, legal representative's name, or registration number of the company to check on ICIC's website to see if it's legitimately existing. Detailed information of this company can also be found. Uh, we list here the website address of SAIC. If a company is registered with a local ASC, you can use the name registration number of the company to check on the relevant website. Next slide, please. This is the website of one local ASC authority. It's Hebei Provincial ASC. As you can find out, it's in Chinese. So if you have anyone who can read and write Chinese, you can do the online ASC check yourself. But if you cannot, in case your, your business is about to export to China or investing to mainland China, you can contact us. Send us the duplicate business license. We can do the online ASC check for you. OK, next slide, please. You can also Double check with the website of National Administration for Code and Asian for Organization. Uh, the advantage of this check, comparing with check with the website of the AIC authority, is that this, of, this website is a nationwide website. You can use company name, the organization code, or registered address of the company to do the online check. This is also, this uh, public online check is also available for public check. And you can read and write Chinese, OK, you can do it yourself. Next slide, please. Company stamps. Company stamps equal to signature of person authorized to sign on behalf of the, the company in Europe. So company stamps are very important. Every company has an official company stamp. We call it common seal. This stamp represents the company. The stamp on the left is the old version, the old version common seal of a company. The, the stamp on the right side of the slide is a kind of new anti fake version applied now in some provinces in China, such as Beijing, Hebei province. But it's not uh, unified yet in the whole mainland China. And there are also other company stamps for special use. For example, for special contract use, for finance use, for invoice use, for customs declaration use. Uh, except uh, for company stamps, another important stamp is name stamp of the legal representative. The legal representative can act on behalf of company. So as names that sometimes can you can be used 
ang segments. We talk about power of attorney just now. Can you remember that a power of attorney can only be chopped by the commensal of the company? And a contract only common seal or come stamp for special contract use can be used. Usually, common seal stands for special contract use, for special finance use, and the invoice use are required to be filed with local public security bureau. In some places, stamps for custom declaration use or name stamp of the legal representative is also required to be filed. Company stamps shall be round or oval. So now you can see the rectangular one uh, we see we saw just now under the in the slide about fake company. It's not an effective re, effective real one. Requirements for the shifts of the company stamps may vary in different places. So checking with the competent local public security bureau is suggested. In the scam example about the power of attorney, we checked with the public security bureau in Dalian, which makes us able to identify that their potential Chinese partner is an imposter. Next slide, please. Supertinize the company's paperwork, including examining information on the company's website. First, see its language version. If it's in English alone, there's something abnormal. Just imagine, in your own country, you have your own official language, but the company registered there uses only Chinese as its language on the website. It's not normal, right? Okay, and review, examine the con contact information including the uh, telephone area, area code. This is the website of a potential Chinese partner. The company, according to the, reg the, the address here, is registered in Guizhou, uh, in Guizhou province. But they gave their cell phone number instead of fixed telephone number. Also in the fax number, the area code is 010. That's, that belongs to Beijing, not to Guizhou province. We checked online based on the name of the company, the duplicate business license we received, and find this company does exist. But obviously, people contacting the at USME are not who they claim they are. They use the name of a legitimately existing company to create their own website, put their own contact information there. If you communicate with them business with later on with their own bank account, usually it will be an individual bank account or some bank account uh, in Hong Kong or some other areas outside of China. So be careful and don't uh, neglect any information you received from the potential Chinese partner. Your prudence will save you much trouble. Okay, next slide please. Verify other mandatory documents. Uh, it depends on what business activities you are engaging in with a Chinese partner. If you would like to set up a rep office or subsidiary here, then you need to rent an office. Ask the landlord to provide ownership certificate. 
collect financial information. Next slide, please. Collect financial inf information. Um, can you note that uh, here, capital re verification report shows how much has been contributed by the investors. But um, with the operation of a company, is that assets may change. It may increase with profit, decrease with loss. So financial statement or audit report shows its financial conditions currently. Ask the partner to provide these financial uh, documents, including the credit report. This report can be issued by the Credit Reference Center of the Central Bank here in China, we call it People's Bank of China. But without the consent of the Chinese company, other people cannot access this such information. So ask the Chinese partner to provide such document. Next slide, please. Uh, company operation. Check personally with different independent third party, including other companies you know in the same industry, even employees, when you visit their premises. Next slide, please. Based on introduction on common scams and their preventive measures just now, here are some quick tips for you. Pay attention to the bank account you are given. Do not pay to individual account if your partner is a company. Pay attention to the contact information. And change of the partner in communication style. In our previous experience, some USMEs were scammed not because they are not smart, but because they, are, they were driven by the commercial interests so much that they neglected the risk that should they identify. So if it's too good to be true, be careful. OK, next slide, please. The last part of, this, of today's webinar, what to do if, unfortunately, an USME suffered from losses due to a scam by a Chinese partner. Here we give some introduction on this. Uh, next slide, please. When being scammed, many people tend to act promptly with knowing what they have at hand for a fight. Review what you have. This should be the first step, even before your negotiation with the Chinese partner. Do a preliminary check on the partner's current situation. Online AHC check, that's though it's preliminary and uh, for reference, but it can give you a first impression if you can pinpoint the partner. Also check the clauses of governing law and dispute settlement in the contract. Collect and review all that can be used as evidence that can support your claim. And find a trusted and independent local legal advisor. If the governing law of the relevant contract is Chinese law, engage a PRC licensed lawyer to conduct in-depth check on the company if necessary to Make analysis of the case and the materials you have to represent you to negotiate. Next slide, please. If negotiation fails, there may be two solutions. Report to police or follow the provision about dispute settlement in the contract. If you can identify the partner, if this partner legitimately exists, and people contacting you represent the company. The contract between you and the, your Chinese partner is valid. Then, under most circumstances, it will be treated as a trade dispute. If you report to police for scams, it is possible they do not accept the case. For trade dispute, before you decide to take action, please consider several elements listed here first. Most of these had better be done by legal advisors. 
First, I'd like to talk about the uh, third point on this slide. Review what is provided in the contract for dispute settlement. If arbitration is agreed and the provision on this is a valid arbitration clause according to the governing law, then resort to arbitration. If it is provided that litigation is the dispute settlement mode, or no agreement on litigation or arbitration, or the arbitration clause is invalid according to the applicable law, then litigation is the way to solve the dispute. Before you decide to resort to lit litigation or arbitration, calculate and compare the losses you suffered and the expenses you may take. It, it may take you. Um, for example, the legal fees for legal advisors, the translation fees if the documents are not in Chinese, the notarization fees. Uh, can you note that evidence formed outside China need to be notarized and legalized and translated into Chinese, including the documents proving the, the legitimate existence of the USME in this country. And also, take into account the case acceptance fee by the court arbitration tribunal. And then estimate your chance to win that case. The important thing is not what the truth was. It is the important thing is if you can prove it. Under normal circumstances, a party here in China, if the governing is Chinese law, if a party uh, claiming claims that something, then he needs to assume the responsibility to prove it. If the USME cannot provide evidence proving what it claims, then it may fail. Next slide, please. Treat the trial and the enforcement phase as a whole process. The purpose of engaging in a lawsuit or arbitration is not to win the case alone. The purpose is get your laws compensated. So once you decide, take action quickly. Consider applying to court for injunction to freeze the property of the partner. So when you win the case, there is assets of the partner available for enforcement. You may also consider a report to police for criminal contract fraud, but as I said, it's probably it's probable that the police will not accept the case. Next slide, please. The threshold amount involved for the police to accept the case of criminal contract fraud is over 20,000. There's no national standards what amount shall be considered as huge or especially huge. We list here some local standards for reference. In different places, the threshold amount for being huge or especially huge may be different. Only criminal liabilities are listed in the Chinese criminal law. There's no clear provision where and how a foreign company can be compensated if the partners, the Chinese partner's behavior constitutes due to criminal contract fraud. Next slide, please. Uh, what if the amount involved is less than 20,000? The partner, according to the regulation here, the partner shall bear administrative liabilities. As you can see on this slide, it is light, not a heavy one. So summarizing this part, we have to say that it takes time as well as money to pursue the liability of the Chinese partner who cheated. This is why we do the webinar today to share with you how to conduct due diligence on potential partners, how to take preventive measures to identify those dishonest partners. It does not help USMEs earn money, but it helps prevent the USMEs from losing money. Next slide, please. So here, uh, we give you a brief summary of today's webinar. And uh, do treat it seriously. Do not take the company's self-introduction at face value. Collect and scrutinize the company's paperwork, uh, as well as operation, if possible. If you can have someone uh, on, spot, on the spot you trust, send him to the 
and partners' premises. Always ask, remain vigilant. Ask yourself, is this too good to be true? Do not go rashly. Pay attention to the recent situation. If your Chinese partner's uh, communication style, the communication uh, contact information change, like the one we mentioned in one scam examples, pay attention, double check. And the last advice, to consult with local professional advice. It's very important. And if it falls within the service remit of US Me Center, we are here for you. Do not hesitate to contact us. And next slide, please. A report of the center. We have, we just mentioned, Know your partners in China, which gave a detailed, more detailed information on how to conduct due diligence uh, to take preventive measures. You may download this report at the link on our website. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Helen, and an awful lot of information to digest that. A lot of very, very valuable information and advice and um, obviously I think that the, the key message there is that anyone that is, does think that they're, they're, they're being scammed or is concerned about it so it should definitely contact EU SME Center or CBBC and legal partners to seek further advice. Um, Obviously, we will be sending out um, a copy of today's presentation, um, and I'm sure that, that some of you will have follow-up questions. Um, we're running out of time a little bit, so I've just got time to, to pose a couple of questions to, to Helen. Um, the, okay. first, the first one is from Luca. Uh, she, uh, j just asking about the, um, about the, you mentioned there, Helen, about the AIC check as being one of the, the basic uh, due diligence checks that you can carry yeah. out. Um, is that something that the EU SME would, uh, would, would charge for in terms of helping a company to make that check? Uh, you mean the online AIC check I just mentioned, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, if it falls within the scope of uh, the service remit of the center, I mean uh, the EU SME, they export to China or uh, invest in China. Uh, they can send us the duplicate business license of their potential Chinese partner, and the, we can do the online AS check free of charge. All services provided by USME are free of charge. Great. That, I mean, that's that's great that that that's a free service available for any for any company. I mean, I I think as well that it's um it it's likely to be dependent on where the company is located. I think that. From my understanding, that there, there are um, some of the some of the local AICs have that online yeah. search function, yeah. and others don't. So, what would you do for companies that are maybe in uh, regions where they, that there is no website search uh, function available? Uh, most uh, AIC authorities they provide uh, online AIC checks. So far, uh, we. We did many due, uh, preliminary due diligence for USMEs, and the, the only ASC I uh, find which do not provide this such online AS check is Shandong Province. So far. Okay, great. That's, yeah. that's, that's if they don't provide, then uh, unfortunately we can do nothing about it. But uh, the uh, Dominating percentage of AIC authorities they provide such public service. Okay, I just have have one more question here from Kyle. Um, you you mentioned there about uh, the the minimum threshold for taking legal action being about twenty thousand renminbi for the police. So that's uh, mm -hmm. around about two thousand pounds, which which actually seems quite 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 a low threshold. Um, yeah. Companies looking to that's a very very 
uh, old regulation, but still it's valid and it's effective and not updated by the authority. So uh, in practice, the Public Security Bureau used this at the threshold to decide whether they will uh, take their, they will accept the case. Okay, and when, when pursuing legal action in China, I mean obviously companies will have legal costs to consider. So, I mean, do you have any advice in terms of what a realistic threshold is? So, I mean, if, if a loss is below a, a certain amount, it may not be worthwhile pursuing legal action. Um, in fact, it, it depends. Uh, first, uh, what you have at hand. If the documents, all the documents, the contracts, the um, the you, you all the documents you have at hand can prove that you can win the you can win the case, uh, then you may consider it. If in many cases some USMEs they came to us say we want our money back, but we say, okay, you can send us your your uh, the documents you have things, uh, uh, you know, uh, provision of evidence is very important. As I said, it's it's the, it's more important than uh, what the fact is. So if the U.S. media they cannot prove it, then we can do nothing about it. And and so even though if in such case uh, the amount is is low, and if in case of the amount involved is low, but they can provide very, uh, say, it's usually we, uh, the, the scams we, we uh, the USMEs encounter as far as we know, it's about, say, uh, 20,000 uh, US dollars. And uh, if it's very difficult to prove they they were cheated by the Chinese partner, if they uh, they report to their uh, police for this or follow their trade dispute settlement mode, then uh, they may pay their uh, legal advisor. They need to provide even the police will require documents in Chinese, they may do the translation or even notarization, it costs much. Uh, in fact, if there's little chance to uh, win the case, no matter how much uh, higher the, the amount involved is, it's not worth to, you know, uh, spend more money on it. Yeah, great. It really okay. depends. Yeah, so it's very much about the body of evidence that you have, and if you have a strong case, then that's maybe more important than yeah. the actual yeah. uh, the actual value lost. Okay, well, thank you very much, yeah. Helen, for, for for answering those questions. Um, anyone that has other questions, please feel free to send them through, and we will um, put you in contact with Helen to follow up afterwards. Uh, just as we uh, just to wrap up very briefly, just to point you in the direction of our YouTube. Um, site where many of our, our webinars are available to be to be viewed on there. Uh, again, just to point out also the, the Twitter feed, lots of information and advice on there. Um, also, just to mention our China Business Conference on January the 14th here in London. Hope to see as many of you there as, as are available that date. Please uh, visit our website for more information. So with that, I will wrap up. And again, please feel free to pass through any questions or comments through to us um, or contact us via the contact details on our, on our website. And I uh, hope to see you tomorrow for the session on marketing uh, your products in China. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. That was quite a long one, wasn't it?